Greetings, this is Dyslexi, and today we're going to talk about the Arma 3 Helicopter DLC, and more specifically, the Advanced Flight Model. I did a video on this a bit ago in which I raised various critiques with how the new flight model worked, and promised to do an updated video if things changed. Well, in short, things have changed, and it's in a good way. This video will be structured as follows. First we'll go over my original complaints, then we'll move on to some new features, and then we'll summarize everything nice and pretty and tie it with a bow. Note that this is predominantly about the flight model itself, not the other features, though I will touch on them at the end. First off, I'd like to cover my recent real-world helicopter experiences as they relate to this. If you haven't already seen it, I've started a series of videos based on spending just shy of 19 hours in a Robinson R44, which you can find the first episode of here. The R44 is a light helo, and I also had some time flying an OH-6, the Vietnam-era equivalent to Armor 3s MH-9. Because of this, I'm going to predominantly focus on the MH9 and AH9 in, in this video. They're the same size and style of helo that I have some personal experience with now, and I know more or less how they should respond in reality. I can't say how well simulated the other aircraft are, but this should at least give you an idea of what the light helos are like. So getting down to business. The very first thing you should do is make sure your controls are set up precisely. There are some issues with how Arma sets the defaults, and also some traps that can catch you in control binding. First off, check the dead zones of your controllers. Helicopters operate off of very sensitive cyclic controls, and you'll want no dead zone for the best effect. Go through each controller and check that they're zeroed out, as you can see here. Now, one of the things that I noted in my, my prior impressions video on this flight model was that there was something off about how the controls work, that they felt overly sensitive and floaty. I hypothesized at the time that there might be something in the interface between Rotor Lib and Arma 3 that was messing things up, but that I hadn't figured it out at that point. Now, as it turns out, there was one thing that was amiss, and that's how Arma 3 handles dual throttles when mapping collective. If you have a Warthog throttle like me, or some setup where multiple axes are assigned to collective, you'll need to do something deliberate to avoid this issue. Go to your collective mapping, and make sure only one axis is mapped to the throttle. If you don't do this, Arma will combine the two axes and completely fuck up the collective response. It'll essentially double the inputs, and leave you with the front and back of the throttle range being unresponsive, while the center is hypersensitive. You can check this easily by flying a Blackfoot and looking at the HUD readout of Torque. If you have doubled controls, no collective will cause it to read negative, and adding collective will cause it to max out at 100% well before you reach the end of the movement range. Now this issue has been reported, it'll hopefully be addressed, but for now that's the workaround for it. If you're using a Warthog like I am, for the record, I bind the left throttle as collective. This is just how I tend to hold the throttle and it gives the most precision for me. Your mileage may vary. So with all that out of the way, you should find the control responsiveness to be pretty reasonable. Now as far as your game settings, I'd strongly recommend the following. Anything else doesn't really live up to the whole advanced flight model. So the first setting is show gauges. It's up to you. I keep it off due to flying the, uh, the little birds, and the panel has the correct instruments for these. I find the flight path indicator that shows up with the gauges on to be somewhat cheesing it for helicopters that don't necessarily have that capability in reality, but you know, it's up to you. I mean, yeah, it's the future, woohoo, but still, it's not as exciting. For rough landings, disabled. If you're breaking your helo while landing, this is God's way of telling you that you're doing something horribly wrong. Fix it, adapt, and overcome. Learn how to fly. Wind effects, um, on. E even if the wind modeling is, is fairly bland, it's still better to have this on than off. It can make things more interesting. Auto trim. Disabled. If you're trying to fly a helo sim without pedals, it's not the smartest decision, so you could be forgiven for using this while you save up for pedals. But if you have pedals and turn auto trim on, you're missing out on a, a much richer experience. You're kind of defeating the point of it. Stress damage. Enabled. Unless you run into some horrible bugs with this, stress damage will prevent you from doing absurd abuses to the airframe. And this is a good thing, what with the advanced flight model being a simulation in the end. So that's the settings. Now on to the, the issues I had previously. Uh, next up we have the tail rotor responsiveness. The original builds of this flight model had a, a very strange tail rotor response where the tail rotor and boom behaved as if there was no slipstream while traveling at speed. This confused the flight model and made for some outlandishly incorrect behaviors when applying pedal at speed. In the release version, the tail rotor seemed to be much more reasonably modeled. You can yaw somewhat at higher speeds, but you can't flip a 180 until you slow down to something more reasonable. I can't say if this is perfectly correct, but it's far better than how it was before. So in that respect, we'll chalk this up as an improvement. I also spoke about rotor RPM in the prior video. 
One of the things I hoped to see was a rotor RPM gauge on the 2D gauges panel, but unfortunately this hasn't happened. It would also be nice to have a torque gauge, but this also hasn't happened. You have to look for that on the actual instrument panel and hope that the aircraft has it modeled in high fidelity, like the MH9 and AH9. There is an altitude gauge. It's pretty much a total waste of space and a wind gauge that gives direction but no strength of the wind and takes up as much space as the more important gauges. I think you could take these two gauges, take them away, replace them with torque and rotor RPM, and then do some simple condensed wind and altitude readouts. You have a, a very solid setup, but unfortunately that's just not how it is currently. Maybe in the future. Now they did add an element to the HUD uh, in the upper left that shows the status of things like your engine, landing gear, anti-collision lights, wheel brakes, uh, RPM warning, and torque. And these are nice to have for sure, but Having those torque and RPM gauges in more detail on the actual gauge panel would be much nicer. It's not like you have to choose between one or the other, it's just that it'd be nice to have those. So in addition to that, the, the rotor RPM behaves in a somewhat strange fashion. If you look at your aircraft in level, normal flight, you'll see that the RPM is targeting the bottom of the green arc instead of the middle. This isn't typically how a governed engine will work. You want to be well within that green arc for safety's sake, that's why it's there. You go too high, and you've oversped the rotors, too low, bad things will happen. So that's a, that's a hanging question mark about the flight model, and I, I wonder what issues might stem from having the rotor RPM perpetually lower than it should be, and there also seems to be some evidence pointing towards the RPM handling being a bit flawed when maneuvering. But it's one of those topics that's hard to address. You can, you can work with it as it is, but it may not correspond as closely to reality as one would hope. And then there's Vortex Ring State, or VRS, which was one of the biggest complaints I had of the old model. You'll note that it's not in the release version of the Hilo DLC flight model. However, this is tempered by the fact that it was briefly included in the dev build, and it should be back once it's been polished up to an acceptable level. The initial version was a bit too severe, it, it didn't visually present itself that well, but it was a step in the right direction, just a little awkward first step. So while I'm disappointed that it isn't in from the start, it's clear that it is coming, so I'd rather give them props for holding it back because it wasn't ready, versus them pushing it out due to feeling pressured. They are doing it, so that's what counts to me. I also talked about adding some more immersive camera effects, things that would help to convey the real-world sensations in a more visual fashion. They didn't do everything that could have been done here, but what they did add is nice. As G-force increases, the camera shakes to indicate the higher stresses occurring on the airframe. It's a cool visualization, and it doesn't stop at helicopters. Jets also benefit heavily from this. It makes for a much more alive sensation of flight. You can see the Gs, even if you can't feel them. The automatic head tilting that DCS does during banks is absent, perhaps in the future, and the six degrees of freedom uh, head tracking hasn't changed from how it has been. Still, overall, it's a net positive. This G-Force is it's a nice indication. And then, there's one of the most frustrating issues in the history of ARMA, the aircraft damage and collision model. In the initial version of this flight model, the damage model was very poor. You would explode in situations that previously were okay, such as landing on buildings, and you'd even explode from doing something as simple as a run-on skid landing on a runway's flat surface. Now, I have good news and bad news on this subject, and there's several aspects of the good news, so we'll go through those one by one first. First of all, skid landings are now possible. Not only that, but they have a nice skid scraping sound effect to go with them. You can do these at reasonable speeds on flat surfaces with repeatable success. And as a result of this, running takeoffs are also possible. This is where you don't even have enough power to get into a hover, yet you can drag yourself along the runaway until you hit effective translational lift and take off. This works now, and it's a pretty cool thing. It's a fun little party trick. The buildings that would previously destroy your aircraft when landing on them, the source of that issue has been fixed. You can see here that each of them works just fine, as long as you're reasonably gentle, as would be expected. Another nice improvement is that the main rotor can sometimes be destroyed by a collision, without instantly causing the entire aircraft to go with it. I'm not quite sure how reliable this is. I, I've had instances where a Ghost Hawk has exploded attempting this, while an MH9 merely lost the rotor. So maybe this is Hilo specific, or maybe it's just a intermittent bug, I don't know. It's certainly a step in the right direction. And then there's the bad news, which likewise comes in a few different forms. One is that rollovers still result in catastrophic explosions. It doesn't matter how fast you're moving, how gentle the rollover is, or anything like that. When the aircraft is upside down, it explodes, and that's it, there's nothing nuanced about it. That one aspect does more than anything else to make it so that otherwise survivable crashes are instead catastrophically fatal for all involved. A dynamic rollover will result in the death of all on board, and a hard auto-rotation landing that results in a roll 
who will likewise kill everyone. It's a real shame this hasn't been addressed. Another bit of bad news is that collisions with trees, bushes, and so forth are still terribly flawed. Brushing your rotor disc or skids in a tree will almost always cause an instantaneous explosion at speed. And this just isn't how things work in reality. Trees are not made of concrete, and rotors are not constructed of explosive cotton candy. You can read anecdote after anecdote of this not being how things work in reality. You can ask helicopter pilots for examples of times that they've brushed trees or dragged their skids through the tops of them. There are all sorts of resources that can be consulted to find out the truth of the matter, or at least a general theme. This doesn't need to be perfect, but it does need to have some flexibility in it, and that flexibility and depth is currently absent. I find this particularly disappointing, and I wish it wasn't so. But all in all, the changes to the damage model are a net positive compared to how Arma 3 behaved previously. You gain the ability to destroy the main rotor, sometimes, without taking the whole ship with it, and you can do reliable running landings and takeoffs. Parity is restored via the buildings being usable again for landings, while the negatives are things that have existed in the series for some time. So there's nothing new that I'm aware of that's bad in this respect, but some of the more tantalizing possibilities are still out of reach. Actually, I guess one thing that deserves uh, special note is the stress damage. I personally haven't run into issues with overtorque or, or done anything that would cause catastrophic stress damage, but I do know some reputable pilot types had some concerns about this during the dev staging of these changes. The nice thing here is that if you do end up finding some spiny points in how the stress damage is handled, there's an option in the game to just turn it off. So that's, you know, that's cool, that's welcome. A minor nitpick from the past was that the controls weren't properly animated, the pedals and the collective, the cyclic was. And they are now. There's not much else to say there, it looks good, it's nice to see it. Another aspect is force feedback. It still doesn't have any real support, but I, I guess that's just how things will be until some, some more manufacturers get quality force feedback sticks out onto the market. It was a long shot to hope for better support of things like force trim, but oh well, we can make do. So that's, that's basically a detailing of my prior concerns and how they've been addressed, or not, in the release build. To further summarize it, I'd say there have been a lot of strong improvements since the early iterations, and the way things are now, though not perfectly, it's definitely better. And as is par for the course with Bohemia, I imagine that we'll continue to see improvements, tweaks, fixes, etc. as we go forward to the Marksman DLC and eventually the expansion. So that's a flight model. Moving on, I'd like to talk a bit about some of the things that have shown up as part of the DLC, some of the other stuff. Uh, sounds have been improved a great deal. I mentioned the skid scraping, which is great. There's also a new slipstream effect as well as a spatial sound for when lateral airflow is passing through the cockpit, of something like an MH9. These are a really immersive steps forward from how things sounded previously. Rotor RPM is also more audible now. You can hear the, the changing RPM. Uh, the engine noises are more accurate in general. And there are even specific sounds for engine and tail rotor failures. Another nice detail is that the weight of troops actually does influence the flight model. Here I am touched down with just a pinch less power than I need to come into a hover. As I tell my crew and passengers to debark without touching the collective, you can see that I lift up after only a few have stepped off. With the passenger weights being abstracted at something like 200 pounds per person, the seven other crew give me a, a 1400 pound reduction in weight, which drastically decreases the power needed to hover. If uncorrected, like I'm showing you here, you pop up into a high hover rather quickly. This adds a fun mechanic to dropping troops off from a hover. You have to anticipate their movements and work the collective accordingly. And at the same time, it gives another good reason for why touchdown landings can be more forgiving and less stressful if you have the appropriate areas for it. Sling loading has also been added, and it's quite well done. It's surprisingly well done. Hopefully this can be expanded to things like fast roping, spy rigging, uh, McGuire rigs, and similar things in the future. As it is, it's a nice logistical improvement, and the sling load assistant is a simple and functional means to facilitate single crew usage of the feature. I like it. I don't have much to say on it. I'm not a logistics guy, really. But, you know, if this helps the Hilo pack some minigun and FFAR ammo over somewhere where I need it, then hey, that's good for me. Oh yeah, there's this completely awesome feature that's been asked for since the series began. FFV, or firing from vehicles. And I am super psyched to see this finally show up, and it's done pretty well. There's some improvements that can be made to smooth it out a bit, but overall it's, it's very solid, it works more or less how you'd expect, and it opens up the door for all kinds of entertaining scenarios. I do hope to see some improvements to it in the future, such as allowing tank commanders to turn out and use their personal weapons, their binos and stuff like that, but what's already there is a major step forward in gameplay. The two new helicopters in the DLC are pretty cool. We have a future Chinook called a Huron, and a Sky Crane-esque Hilo called a Teru. Teru, I don't know. Both are neat, and the Teru comes with a lot of different variants for things like resupply, medevac, troop transport both in covered and uncovered version, and just a generalized Sky Crane variant. 
and has a surprising amount of versatility because of these variants. So that's the basic story of both the Advanced Flight model and the, the basic Helo DLC feature set. Now, my takeaway from this is that while the initial flight model was very rough, it's been cleaned up quite a bit since and seems like it'll improve going forward. The actual Helo DLC features like sling loading and fire from vehicles, they're, they're quite nice and the two helicopters are neat and useful. I wish there were three or maybe four new Helos, but eh, oh well. The overall package is certainly a gain for the Arma series, and it seems clear that Bohemia was listening to the community's feedback about the flight model in particular. I must say that I, I do sincerely hope that the damage model is given some much needed love in the future. It's one of the most disappointing aspects of the overall package, but that's more a legacy Arma issue than something that this DLC specifically introduced. I guess it's also worth noting that I like this kind of DLC much more than past efforts. I wasn't a fan of Queen's Gambit for Armor 1, uh, the PMC, the BAF, or the Czech DLCs for Armor 2, but this Helicopter 1 and the upcoming Marksman DLC both do things that I like to see. They expand the gameplay opportunities at the, at the base level instead of just adding a new army or vehicle set. Giving the players more fundamental ways to have fun in Armor pays off in huge dividends, and introducing that new tech makes it possible for the community to adopt it into a broad variety of new add-ons. I'd much rather see firing from vehicles show up than trickle down into community add-on efforts than to see something like a, a new vehicle that the community could have done on its own anyway, or an emphasis on official single-player content that I don't personally see as the biggest draw of armor at this point. I'm, I'm here for the sandbox. Now, as to how this compares to actual flight, like I said earlier, I want to address that more properly through my flight series. If you'd like to venture into that, take a look at the first video here, and also linked in the description. I think you'll enjoy it. As for my final verdict, let's close this out. The Helo DLC is a solid effort. The flight model, while not perfect, is much improved since my last adding with it. And more than that, FFE is great to have. Sling loading is really cool. The new Helos, the Turu in particular, the Teru, ah fuck it, whatever. The one that starts with a T, they're solid additions. And I look forward to seeing what the community does with all of this in the future. As well as where Bohemia takes these features going forward. So it's, you know, let's close it on a nice happy note. It's cool. We're in a good place. This is nice. This is good stuff. Keep this up. More of this, basically. So that's, that's all I've got to say about it for now. I hope you enjoyed it. This is Dyslexi, and until next time, take care, and watch your rotor speed.